Good afternoon, and welcome to another program in the Distinguished Speaker Series hosted by Temple Beth Shalom of Sarasota, Florida. Special thanks to Dr. Isaac Calvaria, Chairman of the Programming Committee, and to our Zoom technical advisors, Elliot Korn and Joel Servitz, and especially to our rabbi, Rabbi Stuart Altschuler. Today's program is a webinar. Questions and answers, questions can only be entered via the Q&A and via the chat. We will hold questions after the presentation. I will read the questions and then the ambassador will answer the questions as, as follows. And then we will turn the program ultimately over for, to Lauren Haven for final words. But we begin with an introduction by our rabbi, Rabbi Stuart Altshuler. Rabbi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Is, sound is good? I, um, I want to do a couple of things uh, before we get started. And I, okay. I um, looked up to see how many people have been needlessly murdered in Ukraine. And it's very hard to tell. The figures run from about 2,345 civilians to, to 10,000, which is probably uh, a bit large. Uh, and estimated about 10,000 Russian soldiers have been killed. Just as he were, we are here, everyone, for uh, our, our remembrance of Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day. And the term Holocaust is thrown around a lot. Just for perspective's sakes and not to take away from the barbarity and the shock to our system of what has happened in Ukraine. But I think it's a good reminder that 10,500 Jews were murdered every single day in Auschwitz during the three peak months of early 1944. Just some perspective there. Six million is quite a number. That's uh, 100 football stadiums filled in the course of four years of, of the uh, amount of uh, our people who were, who were killed. Another couple of interesting statistics that I just came across, a poll taken in 2020, two thirds of Americans from the ages of 18 to 39 have no idea that 6 million Jews were, were murdered. One half of Americans in their 20s and 30s could not name a single concentration camp, death camp, or ghetto uh, from World War II. And one out of eight Americans are now saying they never even heard of the Holocaust. Just... That is part of the magnitude of why it is important for us to be together. And before I introduce my first guest, uh, dear friend Moritz Grunigan, his wife Frederica is kind of halfway there. I want to read uh, this reading, set the tone, and recite uh, a memorial prayer, and then we'll get started. Recall with bitter grief the catastrophe, the Shoah, which overwhelmed our people in Europe, adding an unprecedented chapter to our history of suffering. We mourn for six million of our people, brutally destroyed by quote unquote civilized people behaving like savages. The cruelties of Pharaoh, Haman, Nebuchadnezzar, and Titus cannot even be compared with the diabolical schemes of the modern tyrants, and they're designed to exterminate an entire people. The blood of the innocent who perished in the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, Buchenwald, Dachau, Treblinka, and Theresien cries out to God and humanity. We will never forget the burning of the synagogues, and houses of study, the destruction of holy books and scrolls of Torah, the sadistic torment and murder of scholars, sages, rabbis, and teachers. They tortured the flesh of our brothers and sisters, but they can never crush our spirit, their faith, and their love. We recall our brothers and sisters in the Warsaw Ghetto and in other hellish places who valiantly rose up and defied the monstrous adversaries. We recall the heroism of those who in the face of unprecedented and overwhelming force maintained Jewish life and culture and asserted Jewish values in the very midst of enslavement and degradation. 
even as we mourn, we recall those precious, compassionate men and women of other faiths and nationalities who at the peril of their lives saved some of our people. Truly, as our rabbis taught, the righteous of all the nations of the world will have a share in the world to come. And we are blessed by having two of those individuals who have done so much for our people in recent times. God, remember your martyred children. Remember all who have given their lives for Kiddush Hashem, the sanctification of your name. Exalted, compassionate God, grant perfect peace as we are here gathered uh, to remember in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure whose radiance is like the heavens to the souls of all the men, women, and children of the house of Israel who were slaughtered, strangled, and burned in the Shoah. May they rest in paradise. Master of compassion and love, may they find eternal shelter beneath your sheltering wings. And may their souls be bound up in our lives, in the bond of life. Adonai is their portion. As we remember them, we pray that they are resting in shalom and peace. So uh, our first guest, uh, Moritz Groning. Your friend, we met, I don't know how many years ago it was in London, but we became very close. In fact, you should know that we had Thomas Harding speak to our congregation already about the marvelous work that's being done in uh, Gross Glanike due to your efforts in restoring lost Jewish property there. I saw it firsthand and I've been so honored um, to know you and be with you, share Bible with you and religion with you. You're so precious part of my life, and I'm so honored that you're here with our congregation. So if you can say a few words, it's such an honor for us. Well, I think the honor is on, I shouldn't say my part, but rather our part, because I'm here with Frederica, my wife. Um, and it's been our personal journey for the last 10 years, which has been together. Um, and Stuart, thank you so much for making us part of that journey. Uh, we met eight years ago in, in London, Belsa Square indeed, and uh, without Thomas, we wouldn't have met. But to be frank, we wouldn't have met without the Holocaust, probably, um, which has been quite a legacy for us. And I just want to flag three or four events of those last 10 years, which were really important for us. So my family owns a house in Gross Clinic, which was built by a Jewish family who was very much influenced by Herman Cohen and uh, an extremely educated family. Um, and they, um, so the house came on us and we restored it without knowing much of the history and we learned it. But in 2014, Thomas and his family came to clean up the Alexander house. It was more of a visit, but the evening before they came in and I thought it's nice to have a few uh, uh, grabs of, of, of wine and, and, and cheese. And suddenly Angela Thomas aunt came up and said, Morris, wouldn't you, would you mind if we would light the candles? And we hadn't thought of anything. So suddenly we had Shabbat Lass and they brought everything from the, uh, from the cover to the plate, whatever it was necessary, they brought it. And it completely changed the scene. It was exactly 75 years since candles had last been lit in that house, which was quite something. There, there was a start. And then in 2015, we met uh, in Gross Klinika Stuart, and you took the pulpit, not as the first rabbi in that church, in the village church, but first one on the pulpit and taught us about how to, um, how to learn of the, of the uh, Tower of Babel, um, of the, the dispersion of languages as something enriching. 
which I found extremely interesting. So that was something which really moved the community yes. and, and people learned. Um, the, <clears throat> and the last thing I want to, to mention as, a, as an event was in 2019, and you mentioned that in the Tara scroll that were lost. Now, one of the scrolls that were saved was the Alexander Torah of Belsa Square Synagogue, which was saved because the synagogue in Berlin didn't want to have it as a net, uh, on loan, but only as a gift. So the Alexanders kept them and it would have been burned if, it, if that stayed in Berlin. Now the, the Torah returned to London and the scribe who restored it wrote the mezuzah, which is now on the door of the Alexander house, which is uh, again, something that we, uh, Peter uh, uh, Zussmann, uh, put it there. So that was <clears throat> quite a journey for all of us. And what I have to say is, I'm really glad that now we are working with the Leo Beck Stiftung, which is in Germany, um, one of the largest educational uh, uh, foundations um, to make this into a center of education and reconciliation. So it builds on the future rather than just remembering the past and a Jewish friend of ours from the Netherlands, a benefactor to that house said, Moritz, you know, it's not a museum, it's a school. And he was quite right because it is about the future and about life, not just lingering with the dead. So that is what I want to flag. And I want to dedicate this um, to um, Anna Abraham, who actually was the owner of our house and who perished in the Holocaust in 1944, um, and to her brother-in-law and sister-in-law, <clears throat> Martin and Greta Brook, who died almost exactly 80 years ago in Minsk uh, or in the wood uh, near Minsk. And their son, Vernon, he came on a kinder transport to London. He went to Canada. We found him in 2014 and he came to Berlin after 75 years, he returned to that house. And um, for him, it was a journey home. And it was for us really getting this circle and carrying this torch to the future. So that's what I have to say. And I stop it there because it was quite enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, Morris and Frederica. Give my love to your kids and let's see each other soon. Definitely. I would. I'm uh, introducing another dear one in my life, uh, Ambassador Peter Amon, who about, oh, I guess Peter was about uh, five, six years ago. And uh, we had the most, <laughs> well, I remember the grandest time in the embassy, just talking and getting to know each other. And we talked about everything in life. And you were such a gracious host. We came to the embassy many, many times and uh, felt so honored in your presence. And then of course, what I, what I know about you and what you've contributed to, not only to your country, but to the world and in particular, your, your support uh, for the Jewish people and for the state of Israel. We talked at length about that. I am so blessed to have you in my life. And I'm so honored now that you're sharing who you are and what you've done as ambassador from Germany to the United States and then to the United Kingdom. And of course, one of the major, major figures really in not only your country and all of Europe. So we are very honored to have you here, Peter, uh, and your friend. And I, I, am, uh, I, I pray that God just continue to give you and Marlies and your kids blessing and health and all the goodness that you bring to everyone else. So I hand it now to my dear friend, Ambassador Peter Amon. Well, uh, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, dear Stuart, for these extremely kind words of introduction and for the many signs of friendship and for the many, as you said, inspiring conversations in both directions with you that I could enjoy when we met in London. Today, you've invited me to join you and your congregation for Yom HaShoah. I'm aware what this gesture means for you, for your colleagues, for, for your congregation, for Holocaust survivors and their descendants to invite a German, a German like me, and even more someone who has represented Germany abroad as an ambassador for a long time on such a day. 
I must say I'm deeply moved. Of course, I can no longer speak for the German government, but when you, dear Stuart, asked me to share with your congregation my very personal views, how it was to grow up in post-war Germany, struggling with this incredible guilt, I just could not say no. In retrospect, I can say that the unspeakable pictures of the Holocaust horrors, the unforgettable stories of Anne Frank and of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the black and white photos of the liberation of Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen, to name just a few, they have shaped my life, in my life, my view of the world and were with me from my childhood days and uh, they never left me since. And as an adolescent in the 1960s, I was outraged when I, like others in my generation, found out that many of the perpetrators and their obedient enablers were still living their unnoticed lives among us as our teachers, neighbors, lawyers. Many, if not most of them, could live their lives out with, without proper judgment. And only a few peripheral figures who were very young at the time and are in their 90s or even older now today are facing court as we speak. Later in life, I knew that I represented a different Germany when I worked in various parts of the world, negotiating international treaties, economic agreements with foreign countries. But the stories of the Holocaust never left me. I came to the personal conclusion that Germany can never escape its responsibility and we cannot expect forgiveness. But when I was traveling to Israel, when I was meeting survivors and their descendants, I often was overwhelmed by an outstretched hand of friendship. I heard people saying, there's a sense that we share a common history, horrible as it is, a history which every generation must face again and again, so that the descendants of the victims and of the perpetrators can share a joint responsibility. A responsibility to be always watchful and ensure that the horrors of the past cannot repeat themselves again. I think it's important for you to know that in Germany of today, the memory of the crimes committed during those 12 years of Nazi rule is not slipping away in the fog of history as generations pass one after another. The young people in Germany today are much more acutely aware of the crimes committed, which are now eight or nine decades in the past, much more than previous generations in Germany. School curricula now make Holocaust education a prominent point. And the never ending search for an answer to the question, how could this ever happen, has produced the national consensus in my country. We will defend our post war society, which is built on the principles of democracy, respect, and tolerance. We will defend it not only because we owe it to our history, but because we have to protect our own future. The battle against anti Semitism and our unwavering commitment to the state of Israel has become the raison d'etre of the Federal Republic of Germany. And now Germany is proud to call itself one of the closest allies Israel has in the world. And I must say, these principles stand above the fluctuations of day to day politics. But of course, we have to remain watchful and constantly on the lookout for every sign of intolerance anti-Semitism, racism in our society and beyond. Unfortunately, in Germany, as in the rest of the world, the threat of evil will never quite go away. Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day is a wake up call to remind ourselves and our children not to be complacent and take a tolerant and peaceful order of the world for granted. The Ongoing Russian attack on Ukraine, you mentioned it, Stuart, is a case in point. And I heard of a Jewish family from Odessa who had to leave their hometown last week and found refuge in, refuge in Germany. 
They said to the German media, our late grandmother had to flee losing everything when German troops brutally invaded Odessa. She would have never believed that we now, her children and grandchildren, are seeking shelter in Germany of all places. We Germans are proud that in the last decades, a new generation of Jewish life has begun flourishing in our country. That Jewish schools are being opened and rabbis ordained in German cities. Gradually, a vital gap is being filled in German society. A gap which came about when Germany lost a huge part of its cultural, scientific and business elite who were Jewish at the hands of these murderous facts who had assumed power in Germany in 1933. The war in Ukraine now marks a turning point in our relations with Russia. To put it bluntly, we misjudged Mr. Putin. We believed he would refrain from military adventures, at least out of pure self-interest. A flourishing trade relationship with the West, where the Russian people could buy German cars, Italian handbags, and American iPhones, and pay for it with Russian oil, gas, and minerals, would appear much more attractive to him than the situation he has created now. Situation where his people are facing now international pariah status, economic decline, and the killing of their young soldiers. Putin has missed every strategic goal he might have had. He ruined Russia's and its army's reputation in the world. He subjects his people to poverty and war. He fostered the unity of the West and strengthened NATO. And most of all, the people of Ukraine, who had such a close relationship with Russia throughout history, are now developing a strong sense of national identity by defining themselves as anti-Russian. So Germany is now resetting its Russia policy. We will rebuild our military force, and which we have neglected a lot, and hopefully will be less blue-eyed when dealing with authoritarian regimes in the future. I do not dare to speculate today how all this will end. I hope and pray that this aggression will not escalate to become World War III and lead to nuclear Armageddon. It can be assumed that World War III is not in Russian interest either. But can we be sure that a desperate Putin, who knows that his personal survival may depend on keeping his position as president, will act rationally in the end? We know that Russian military doctrine foresees nuclear escalation as a possible strategy. Escalation strategies can go dangerously wrong as it did, for example, in 1914, when it led to the First World War. Of course, we should not allow these considerations to deter us from helping the victim of an aggression. But all our steps should be fine-tuned, and most of all, in unison with our allies. So much depends on firm and wise American leadership of the West now. But even when Putin will be gone one day, Russia will probably continue to exist as a strategic nuclear power. And we in the West then will somehow have to find ways to live with it. An unchanged Russia will continue to be too dangerous to just ignore it. So we must think ahead and we will need clever and far-sighted diplomacy ready for the time when this war is over. And I say this with much regret. The countries that abstained at the United Nations vote to condemn the Russian attack represent more than half, more than half of the world's population. That shows that global support for Western ideals is less ingrained than we might have thought. Let's face it, on a global scale, we, the West, are a minority. There's so much diplomatic work ahead to reverse that trend now. 
And I sincerely hope that America will be part of this world and will never turn its back to the world and become isolationist again. This won't be in America's interest either. The two big oceans that surround the US can no longer protect it in a modern world. And the value-based Western alliance built by, by US leadership is now, in my, my view, America's greatest asset. As I said, my time as an ambassador of Germany has ended, and I can speak only for myself now. But I worry about the future. I learned that we are walking on thin ice, and civilized societies can turn barbaric overnight. Stuart, you hinted at that earlier. What I hope for is that we all together can strengthen the bonds among natural allies. And I just mentioned Europe, European states, America, Japan, of course, and of course, Israel. Let us remember so that history never repeats itself. Thank you very much. Uh, there is there is one question yes. from um, from Bill Fryn, and I'm trying to let him know that he has to type the question in. So, Bill, if you could type the question in, then the ambassador can read it. I can read it and uh, repeat it for the uh, all the uh, listening audience. So, could you be so kind, Bill, as to type the question in? Let's take notes. Uh, but, ambassador. Bill, uh, if I could, if I just just for a second, uh, ask a question while Bill is typing his question in, and I'd like to bring this back a little bit to Holocaust education in Germany, if that's okay mm -hmm. with you. Now, I'm going to take a stab and say that you were born somewhere around 1953, after the war. Yeah. Excuse me. 1952. Oh, I'm sorry, I was off by a year. Okay, my crystal ball is out at the dry cleaner. <laughs> uh, so my, my question is, I I, and, and so I understand informal. Holocaust education in school, um, it was taught to someone like you. But I just wonder, around the dinner table, was there a discrepancy in what was taught in formal Holocaust education in school versus what was going on in the dinner table? Well, it, <clears throat> this depends very much on the, on, on the personal situation. In my, in my case, I remember that uh, in, in, in my school, uh, uh, the history courses ended with the First World War. The, the, the teacher avoided uh, the, the uh, Second World War and, and the Holocaust and uh, these uh, more modern times at all, uh, totally. And I, I think he had a good reason for that. Um, so I, I didn't learn anything about the Holocaust in school. Now, today, this, this is... Uh, uh, this, this is uh, regular uh, for, for all children to, to learn about the Holocaust in German schools, but not in, in when I was a kid. Uh, the, the other side of it, the dinner table, in my case, uh, my, my family was, uh, um, was, had suffered from the Nazis and they were for political reasons, because we, when my father was, uh, was, at the time he was a party member of the Social Democrats, which didn't go down well with the with, with, with the uh, uh, with, with, with the Hitler dictatorship, and uh, it was a pure coincidence that he survived the war. But uh, uh, so he, of course, I noticed that he had uh, to work with colleagues, and these colleagues came to our house occasionally, and we were uh, ups, ups, we, we had not repented anything. We were. My, I remember my father being red faced after this, these meetings, and and. Uh, and he was totally upset about his colleagues who were not, not willing to accept to learn anything and, and who were, I, don't, I didn't know if they, what sort of crimes they had committed personally, but uh, they were uh, not willing to learn and they were just incredible, stupid and, uh, and um, guilty. And uh, so this, this was my, my situation. I didn't learn anything at school, at school but I, about the Holocaust, but I learned a lot from my father. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have a question, and that is, uh, how would you evaluate the current level of membership in the right-wing organizations in Germany? Yeah, we have had a, uh, a right-wing party appearing 
uh, after the migration crisis of 2015. Before that, there was only, I would say, the uh, few percents uh, of, of, of uh, crazies, crazy people you have in every society. Uh, but after 2015, after, after the, the migration crisis, uh, the, the number of members and voters for the right-wing party grew fast. Uh, and uh, this was, of course, quite worrisome. The government, all other parties, uh, were uh, very clear here. They, they didn't accept any contact, any cooperation with, with this right-wing group. Uh, and now, uh, as the uh, as the migration crisis uh, is no longer on, on, on the front burner, um, the, the party is uh, the membership uh, and, and the voters for the party are falling. Thank you. I have a question from uh, another congregant, Hannah Packhaber. Did your teacher not discuss World War II because he had been involved in a negative sense? Yeah. Well, he, he did, but uh, uh, I think I remember my, my English teacher, actually, he was a horrible guy. <laughs> and uh, and this, this, this man uh, was telling us uh, how, how uh, what a great warrior he was on the Eastern Front and how many Russians he had killed. He was proud of it. Wow. Uh, I'm looking for some other questions from the uh participants here and i don't see any more um certainly ready do does anybody oh there's one new message here hang on let's just see um okay uh, so, uh elliot has sent, said that uh, i could ask um oh there's bill bill freund could you uh, unmute yourself please and uh ask your question to the ambassador yes. uh, elliot was able to make that technical adjustment can you hear me? Yes, yes, Bill, we can. Okay. Uh, Ambassador, I applaud your kind uh, remarks here today, and especially your optimism about the young people in Germany. And I would like to share your optimism. I'm not so sure. I'm a survivor. I'm 95 years old. I was born in Nuremberg and spent the first 11 years growing up among the Nazi regime before we emigrated to America. I was asked uh, not long ago by the Jewish Museum in Berlin to come and speak with high school students mm -hmm. in Berlin, in Auf Deutsch, of course, when we had a, we had a, um, an enlightening conversation, but I found that the Holocaust among these young people is beginning to move into history. It's like a chapter in their history books. I know they're required to study the Holocaust, but it, it's like studying Napoleon and Bismarck. And I wonder if you would comment, did I have a poor sampling of young people or, or am, I mis am I mistaken? Well, first of all, thank you for doing this, uh, for, uh, speaking to me, going to Berlin uh, and talking to young people. I think this is an enormous uh, feat and, uh, and uh, we have to be grateful for, 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 for what you're doing. I'm sorry that uh, you obviously run into a, gr in, into a group of people who did not appreciate that. Um, I, I, I cannot really say uh, if this was an exceptional uh, case or not, but I, I, I stick to the point that uh, in, our, in, in our present debate in Germany, uh, the Holocaust is very, uh, and everything that comes with it, is, is very present in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the public debate in Germany. And uh, the youngsters at school, well, I, I think I, I was a, a very unruly uh, uh, pupil myself at the time. And uh, of, of course, uh, they owe you respect. And if they didn't pay you that respect, I, I can only say I'm deeply sorry. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, I'd like to blend two questions together in together, if I may. Uh, could you comment, if you would, on the government of Germany 
support of Israel and also the underlying support of the people for Israel? Is there a difference or are they both about the same in your, in your view? Well, I think in, in the end, the uh, government can not do what, uh, the, what the people don't want. Uh, so uh, the, the German government really is a, is a, uh, is committed to Israel's security. And uh, I remember I myself when I when I was the undersecretary in, in the German Foreign Office, I signed the the contracts that that uh, uh, led to the building of the nuclear submarines uh, of the sub submarines uh, which went to Israel. Uh, and um, we knew that we had to do this, although this was totally against our uh, export policy at, uh, in general terms, but Israel always was the exception and uh, we made sure that Israel would get what it needs. Uh, and that's what we want, that what they wanted in this case, these three submarines. I don't know if you know the story, but it's, uh, these are submarines which will be extremely important for Israel's uh, security. Yeah because we can, uh, can be used to send out cruise missiles. Um, anyway, uh, the, the, the general public, of course, uh, it's like the American public. You have all kinds of voices, all kinds of, uh, uh, of, of different arguments. So it, it's a, um, it, it's, sometimes it's confusing, but I, I would really, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really sure, and I, I, I hope you believe me that, that I'm that serious here, that uh, the absolute majority, wide majorities, 90, 95%, I would say, or, 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 let's say a rule of thumb, would say, if it comes to the security of Israel, we have to stand by Israel. Thank you. I see that Maurice has his hand up. Maurice, please unmute yourself and join in and jump in the conversation. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I just want to co uh, concur with with uh, the ambassador on on two items and maybe report two things from the work that we do at the Alexander House. Where I take that from first on on Bill Freund's uh, comment, we had an uh, an event with students and we had Margaret Friedlander on board, who many of you may know and uh, may heard of. Uh, she returned to Germany at the age of uh, in her late nineties. And she was there and it was holding a speech. And I think there were some 600 students present and it was absolutely not a single uh, sound was there. What she said is, look, I'm not telling you because I'm telling you the story. You know the story, you can read it in my book. What I'm doing here is I make you eyewitnesses of the second generation. And whatever the, 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 the pupils take from that at this day, they will remember that for life. I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure. So, Bill, I, I would be more optimistic uh, about your effect on uh, on the students than, than you may be yourself, even though I totally understand what you talk about. And the other thing is um, we had a seminar with uh, school uh, children from England and uh, Germany at the Alexander House, a three-day seminar. Um, they prepared very well on the story of their house and how they met. And um, in that uh, discussion, it was a really fierce discussion. One German girl said, look, we're so sorry that we started so late to work on the Holocaust uh, uh, education. And a, an English student got up and said, look, don't be worried at all. In the whole of London, there's not a single memorial of the colonial crimes and it's not being taught in school. So I don't want to put that in relation, but what I want to stress is here that those young uh, people, both from England and from Germany, they are very well aware, and I know that it is a small group of, of people, but it is uh, enormously important that because they are basically multipliers in the future, and that is why I was stressing the point of it being a school rather than just being a memorial place, because you have to activate uh, and, and really make it uh, as an experience rather than just fact learning. And that is, uh, that's really the task for all of us. Thank you. Another question. Um, Ambassador, in your view, is the current anti-Semitism in Germany coming mainly from Muslim quarters because of Israel or from the radical right? 
Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's coming from both sides, unfortunately. Um, but what's coming from the right, the radical right, is um, uh, I, I would count them among the two, three, four, maybe five percent of, of of idiots you have in every society. You see, you 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 can really uh, you, <laughs> it's, it's 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 unfortunate to to say, but every society has a certain number of people who are just crazy. And uh, that I don't want to take it lightly. We have to fight them and we do. They really, uh, they really, uh, the police is, is aware that we have to, uh, uh, that we have to, to make sure they, when we show up, they, we, we really uh, uh, face, Punishment and, and jail and 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 and, and so on, but um, you, there's always a certain percentage of, of people who 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 you, who you cannot talk, uh, teach anything. So the other thing is, of course, the, the, the new the new wave of people who come from who have immigrants who, who came from uh, Muslim countries and who now show their uh, disdain of the existence of Israel. On, on, on German uh, on German streets, and we had been a bit careful addressing this because uh, so easily they could then turn against us and say, "Look, you are you are anti foreigner, you are a racist if you are uh, not let us demonstrate here in public." I think my impression is that slowly uh, the German society uh, no longer accepts this argument and is, is ready to to put a stop sign up here too. But again, I'm not happy with the situation, as you can probably hear me say. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm not pessimistic. No, I can't hear you. No, you can. <laughs> I'm muting myself. My my son had called. Um, uh, I am a big fan of Angela Merkel, but failed to understand why her administration took such a big bet on Russian gas and closed the atomic energy plants. Could yeah. you comment on that, please? I would say no, I'm no longer uh, an ambassador, so I can speak more freely. And uh, I think we made a mistake. As, and as I said, we had thought that by creating an incentive for Russia to uh, trade with us, to, uh, to become a partner in, in, in the world, uh, then Russia would discover that its real interest uh, uh, lies in a peaceful, uh, peaceful world and, and, and a cooperative uh, 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 attitude towards its partners. As I said if, in, in my, my little speech, the, uh, uh, we thought the Russian must have the interest to, to get all the nice things they can buy with the, with, the, uh, with the money they make by selling us gas and oil. So it, uh, we thought that this, uh, now it's turned out to be a mistake, but we thought at the time and uh, that uh, we would make it more unlikely that Russia would misbehave like it does now. Misbehave is, is, is too easy a word, to too light a word, I think. But um, it is uh, a mistake of judgment. And uh, we've turned around our policy in, uh, on February 24th this year. It will go down in history as a day when we've changed our Rus Russia policy 180 degrees. Um. When you hear uh, Vladimir Putin saying he is, quote, just fighting Nazis in Ukraine, what, what, what is your response, your, your visceral response to a, a statement like that? Well, this is, uh, uh, this is, a, this is a demagogue. No? He is, uh, if someone is behaving like a Nazi, it would be him, in this, <laughs> I would say. So uh, this is, this is a, a, tr a trickery in, in the way he expresses himself. And uh, but I should now add to this statement that uh, Stuart mentioned it in passing and in his introduction. We cannot compare what uh, what Putin is doing in, in Ukraine now with the Holocaust. It's a different category. Yeah. So the, the whole uh, the whole comparison uh, to com to say Ukrainians are Nazis uh, uh, is, is totally unrealistic, unfair. It's, it, it doesn't describe reality. And um, I know that uh, there had been some right-wing groups in Ukraine uh, active before, 
but here my my old uh, recipe is uh, in every society you have three, four, five percent of uh, of maniacs, uh, Nazis, uh, and uh, which are unteachable. They uh, they will never learn. So you cannot make an argument uh, uh, for the war out of this. Um, there's one last question from the audience, and I will turn the, uh, turn it over to uh, Rabbi Altshul. I see that his hand is up. I'm sorry for ignoring you, Rabbi. I just wanted to get the uh, questions from the great masses in. Um, you see the question, uh, Ambassador, in Germany, is there a discussion about how someone like Hitler came to power in the beginning, initially? And is this connected to modern times when others want to be when others want to be the second Hitler or follow it in his footsteps? Uh, would you mean the second Hitler in Germany or as a more general question? Well, I, I, guess, uh, I didn't write the question. This was from some, someone else. But I'll let you answer it any which way you want. You're the ambassador, yeah. and so you can answer it. You yeah. the... Uh, to, to well, I, I, I think the if anybody uh, sounds like Hitler or would uh, uh, takes a page from his playbook, this would be the end of any political career in Germany. So this is deadly. This, if, if you are a politician who, who, who wants some success, you you would avoid uh, anything which which it sounds like uh, Nazism is anathema for anyone. So I, I think we really learned a. Uh, uh, learned our lesson from history, but um, of course, in the more general terms, um, uh, when you look back uh, to 19, let's say 19, uh, when was it, 1941 or 32, you had elections in Germany where the Hitler party had less than 5% of the votes, yeah? and suddenly the whole thing turned. And this is a very worrying uh, experience because it shows that uh, uh, as I said, we are walk all walking on thin ice, but not only in Germany, but everywhere in the world. Uh, we cannot be so sure that uh, civilization will hold. Well, thank you. I want to thank all the participants for their excellent questions. I now turn the program over back to Rabbi. Rabbi, it's all yours. Thank you again, Ambassador, and thank you again, Maurice. To the Rabbi. So, uh, I'd like to get the last question. Uh, first of all, uh, Ambassador, thank you so much for being part of here now in Florida. Uh, you mentioned so many things that are, I think that are uh, invaluable for our people to hold on to. We're reading in the Torah portion now in the book of Leviticus, it's called Achare Mot, which means after death. And next week, the portion is called Kedoshim, which means holiness. And what I hear from your message is that as we remember the, the Holocaust today and every day we should, what happened and what's going on in Ukraine, that perhaps there is uh, some new light, uh, so, some new reckoning about the preciousness of our democracies, our freedoms that we take for granted. You mentioned that you are worried about whether we're going to, in a sense, hold on to those values. Uh, and I do too. Uh, are we really dealing here with a big spiritual issue. You know, I'm a rabbi, I look at those, as, you know, not just as a historian, but a spiritual issue. Are, are we fighting in the West for who we are? Do we have any, is this like a last chance to make sure that we're, we know who we're up against and we're not in total disbelief when a Putin or a Kamane or a North Korea or whatever, wherever it comes from, Maybe, maybe there is some hope that this will, will change us and we'll be aware of, of the onslaught that's taking place against the West because there's a lot of negativity I know here in the United States towards anything Western, anything. Racism, we're racist, we're, 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 we, can never, we can never recover from who we are. We're slave owners, we're born that way by birth, which is not a, certainly not a Jewish message and certainly not your message. Is there hope here now going forward? Are we going to be learning from, from these catastrophes? Is La Pen a warning sign? Is the, we just got a report from the ADL yesterday, the highest number of incidents of anti-Semitism in the history of recording in the United States. Just yesterday, out off the press. Are, are, are we in a, going to be in a better direction? What do you think here? Of course, anti-Semitism is always a barometer of other problems in the world, as we know. Mm -hmm. I just want to get your kind of closing thoughts about that one. 
about the struggle for the West to survive. Yeah. Well, it's uh, these are worrying figures that you just mentioned, uh, and uh, I hadn't haven't hadn't heard them before. But I know off the press with very worrisome. Um, in the end, I think it's all up to us if we really uh, stay lay back and say, uh, well, uh, let's enjoy life and forget about the rest and uh, let let it all go. And uh, it's can, is there something that keeps society to, together? A consensus creates a consensus against these extremes. And my my personal belief is that it depends on people. And it's uh, I, I'm really serious. It's not a cheap compliment. I think it's people like you, who who keep societies together in in in, in your in your world in Sarasota and and uh, around the corner as you did in London. And that's why I, I felt so attracted to your work. I, I, I really thought that this is, there's, there's so many bad news, uh, there's so much bad news around. And there, is, there are a few people who really do a fantastic job who work. And uh, sometimes this work, uh, workload looks overwhelming, um, but we cannot afford to give it up, to, to give up because we've seen what, what can happen. And uh, as I said, I'm so worried. I feel the same about you that you you're the kind of person in my life that keeps me keeps my faith going and more it's and my dear congregants as well they give me that strength every day so i can't thank you enough ambassador for being here with us thank you thank you so much so we'll be in touch often i think I, uh, I think we're with uh, laura now to say some concluding well, Rabbi, you took the words right out of my mouth, but um, thank you know I, what you said today was so um, eye-opening and and definitely um, the difference is what goes on here in America with the children learning about the Holocaust and what's going on in Germany is 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 night and day. So um, it it makes me feel um, hopeful in some way that at least the the the. Uh, stories of the Holocaust and, and, and what happened is still going to be living on um, in Germany. And so this will never, ever, ever happen again. That is for sure. So, um, but thank you all. And thank you, Marshall and Elliot and um, Moritz and Frederica for, for joining us from Germany. Um, again, truly amazing conversation today. And thank you, Rabbi, for bringing us once again, another incredible, human being to our synagogue. Um, Ambassador, you were, you were blessed with the truly special, truly thank special. You thank you. Yes. Very much. I'm blessed. Thank you. The program. Thank you all. And thank you, Isaac, too. Isaac Calvary for the programming. Thank you. Isaac, and Eric, you're right and Eric as well. Yep.